Well, we would like to welcome you back to this presentation on the book of Revelation. We are looking at the two witnesses found in the 11th chapter of Revelation. And we hope that as we take a look at these, you'll be able to put it all together because we're still into what the Scripture describes as the trumpets. And we've looked at the 8th, 9th, 10th chapters, now the 11th chapter, and that's what we'll be looking at here today. So we welcome all of you that are joining us, those of you that are here, those that are joining by television or by radio or by the Internet. Glad that you've tuned in, and we hope that uh, as we've gone through this week uh, these chapters in Revelation that you've been able to see the things that God was showing John that's to be shared to you and to me, and particularly the time in which we're living in. So they were looking at the two witnesses uh, found in the 11th chapter that uh, witness in sackcloth. Uh, strange that they're in sackcloth, but we'll look at that and see what it has to say. This brings a section to a close, the 11th chapter does, and one of the principles in understanding Bible prophecy is that God repeats and enlarges. And so he's taken us, for instance, one section was through the seven churches, went through there. Now he, from the fourth to the, uh, through the 11th chapter, he's taking you through another section, starting with the 12th chapter in our next presentation, uh, we start another series that talks about right down at the close of time. So our next presentation is titled, War in Heaven, War in Heaven, and we'll be looking at Revelation, the 12th chapter, and uh, it'll be very, very important as we begin to set the foundation for that next series. So we're glad that you've tuned in as we take a look at God's Word. We're always happy to have uh, Jimmy Rhodes and Pam come and join us, and uh, of course, Donna has worked with me for 25 years, and so uh, you have to be careful because all of a sudden she becomes like family, and you just, you know, she's just there, and you don't, don't uh, say much, but she has been a great, great blessing, and uh, Jimmy and Donna are going to play for you this afternoon. They're going to play a medley of uh, prayer is the key, and then followed with another song about how long has it been? So I hope you'll enjoy it as they play. But before they do, we're going to ask Chuck Allgaier to come out again and read to you uh, the section in the 11th chapter that deals with the two witnesses. Well, if you have your Bible, you know what you do. If you can pick it up and turn it to Revelation chapter 11, we're going to read Revelation chapter 11, 1 through 14. Revelation chapter 11, 1 through 14. Let's read together. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days, 
and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the grave. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered into them. They stood on their feet in great fear for those who saw them. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. The third woe is coming quickly. May God add his blessing to his word. gracious Father in heaven, we come to you. First, Lord, just wanting to give you our hearts, inviting you into our lives, asking, Lord, that you will give to us wisdom, understanding, enlightenment, that as we read your word, we may understand what you have shown and as you reveal what the future holds and where we stand, we pray that each of us may purpose in our hearts and our soul to follow you. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. As I mentioned, we are still in the trumpets. That's what we're dealing with. And we, our last presentation, we looked at the 10th chapter of Revelation and talked there about God's people, 
and the commission that God has for them and what you and I are to do as we prepare for the coming of the Lord. The 11th chapter picks up on the conflict that's going on between God and Satan and God's people and the devil's people and the conflict that develops there. That's what we're going to be looking at in the 11th chapter. And the 11th chapter, like the 10th, is kind of slid in between the 6th and 7th trumpet. That's where it fits in, in the whole thing. And so we hope it'll uh, help you understand exactly what's taking place. Okay, it says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. He's given a measuring rod. He's told to go and to measure the temple, the altar, and the people that worship there. Notice that it's talking about God's people. This is talking about measuring the people as well as the altar and so forth. And actually, when it says measure those that worship there, this is talking about the sealing, the sealing of God's people. That's what's happening when it's the measuring of the people. So this is the sealing of God's people. That's what it's referring to there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to who? The Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So here he says measure the altar, measure the people, measure the temple, but leave out the court because it's been given to the Gentiles. And when it says to the Gentiles, it's basically talking about those that are against God. They're contrary to the Lord. So this is what he's saying. Don't worry about the court. Leave it out. Well, he's making a statement here about what is to take place. You see, there comes a day when there will be a dividing line drawn clearly and probation will close. And in these trumpets, he's down at the end and he's trying to tell them this is what is taking place. And here are God's people. They are being sealed. And here are those that are against God. That's what he's dealing with. That's why it says the day will come when Christ will stand up and say, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And then what happens? Probation has closed and Christ comes. And behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his works. So that's what happens when that line finally is drawn and God in his mercy and in his love is long-suffering and is slow to draw that line. But when it finally is drawn, that will be the end and he's going to come. And so this 11th chapter is talking about the conflict that's taking place there. Do not harm the earth or the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servant of our God on their foreheads. said, don't hurt anything, hold it until we have sealed the servant of our God in their foreheads. And he's talking here to those four angels that are holding back the winds of strife, and he's saying, don't let go. Hang on until we have God's people sealed. That's what he's telling them to do. But leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So he's telling us clearly that he has given a time to the Gentiles. And as you study God's Word, you find there was a time that was given to the Jewish people. You remember he told Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon your people, that was the time he gave to the Jewish people. But at the same time, he has given a time to the Gentiles. And at the same time, he's come to a place where you and I are living today, and we are living in what is called the time of the end. 
That's where we are today. So this 42 months given to the Gentiles, this was Jerusalem, this was the temple, Mount, and there in the court was where the Gentiles could come and go as they pleased in the court if they wanted to, but they couldn't go farther than that. They had, you had to be part of Israel to go in beyond that point. But the court had been given to the Gentiles, and they could there. And Jerusalem will be, this is what Jesus said, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So Christ made it clear it was going to be trampled, and that's not just referring to the city of Jerusalem. That's talking about God's people. That's talking about the end of time. That's talking about the time of the Gentiles that is given to them. God tells us, says, I have laid on you what? A day for a year. Each day for a year has been given. So in Bible prophecy, a day represents one year. He said here it was given to them for 42 months. And in Bible prophecy, a day represents one year. And there is 30 days in a prophetic month. 30 days. If you need to go back to Genesis to prove that with the question of the flood, it makes that very clear that there were 30 days in a month. So if I multiply 30 times 42, that gives me 1,260. So he said it was given to them basically for 1,260 days, and a day represents a year or 1,260 years. And so we find the time that was given to the Gentiles was from 538 to 1798. That was the time given to the Gentiles. At that time, God made great, great effort to take the gospel to all the Gentile world. This is the time known as the Reformation. God had done all this to try to bring them to a knowledge of truth and to accept him this was the effort that was being made. And I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So here he has two witnesses. They have been given a period of 1,260 years to prophesy, and that 1,260 years they're going to prophesy is going to be in sackcloth. Okay? These are two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. So it tells us that these two witnesses are two olive trees. That's what they are. And two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Okay, that, that's the two witnesses. What we want to find out, what are those two witnesses? And if anyone wants to harm them, Fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. So it makes it very clear that uh, you don't want to harm them, the two witnesses. These have power to what? To shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over water to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now, there's many people that want to take this prophecy and say those two witnesses represented Moses and Elijah. And the reason they say that is because Moses, if you remember, is the one who there in Egypt turned the water into blood. And you remember, it was Elijah who prayed that it would not rain and it didn't rain on the earth. Remember those? Okay, for three and a half years. And they take that and try to make this application to it. Uh, let me say that we shared with you the other night, for anything to be confirmed, for anything to be ratified, for anything to be established, it has to be done in the presence of two witnesses. Okay, it has to be done in the presence of two witnesses. Scripture will not accept, and God will not accept, the witness of one person. You've got to have two to substantiate it. So, when it comes to this, 
He's asking for two witnesses, and in other words, the same power, the same power that Moses and Elijah used to establish what they did, that same power is to attend these two witnesses. It is not saying that Moses and Elijah is going to come back in person. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about that they are two witnesses, and these two witnesses will have the same authority and power that the prophets of old had, Moses and Elijah. That's what the Scripture is telling you here. And these are the two witnesses. They're two olive trees. So Moses and Elijah, of their own, did they have any power? No, they were human beings just like you and I. They have no more power than you and I have. But they did have the Word of God. God had told them, it won't rain for three and a half years. They were saying it based on the Word of God. That was the authority that they used, was the Word of God. These are two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Two witnesses. Very important that there are two olive trees and two lampstands. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. So here are the two witnesses. It's talking about the witnesses being there. It's talking about the olive tree and the lampstands. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and other to the left. So you have these two here. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? He said, Tell me, what are these? Now listen carefully to the answer, because he tells him something very definite here. Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord, I don't, I don't know what these are. So the angel said to him, the, This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Okay, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. In other words, again, what he's telling him is this is the authority. This is the word of God, and this takes place not by might nor power, but by the Word of God. This is the way. By my Spirit, this is how it happens. That's what he's trying to establish. What is the purpose of the olive trees and the lampstands? Okay, it's very vital that you understand that because if you understand the purpose, you'll see what is taking place here. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand? And at the left. And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that dip into the receptacle of the two golden pipes from which the golden oil drains? So I hope you're getting a picture. Because here you have the two olive trees, the pipes run from them to the lampstands, and the oil flows to the lampstands. All right, now watch very carefully. So he said, these are the two, what? The two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now he's talking about the two witnesses. He said, these are the two anointed ones. Uh, I want to read to you this text and share with you some Hebrew in here because it's very, very important because the Hebrew sheds a light on it that you don't get in English. So this is what it says. So he said, same text, these are the two who what? Produce light. The Hebrew there is hadashar. That's the Hebrew word, and it means to produce light. These are the two that produce light, who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So when he said, who, who are these two witnesses? He said, oh, these are the two that produce light. Okay. 
Now you should begin to be able to put it together because you have oil, and oil is used throughout the Scripture. It's also used for anointing. In the case of here of uh, Samuel anointing David, uh, the oil was a type of the Holy Spirit. Also, you remember on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples as tongues of fire, right? So you, it has both here, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Therefore, if you have oil and you have fire, what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get light. That's what it's going to do. It's going to give you light. That's what you had in the sanctuary, in the seven golden candlesticks, where the oil was placed in there, and it produced light, shines. So he's saying these two anointing ones, which are the two that produce light, they are my witnesses. Your word, your word is a lamp. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, it's always been amazing to me. And I'm sure that Pastor Jim Gilly back here can testify to this as well as I can, that when you're holding uh, an evangelistic meeting and uh, you're preaching and you're, you're trying to explain the Word of God, and particularly the question of salvation, and you trying to get across what it means, and as you're explaining it, all of a sudden you can see, you literally folks can see something happen in the eyes of some people. The light comes on, Amen. bang, and you, you know it. You, you see it, and you know that it happened. The light came on. They saw it, got a hold of it. This is what it's talking about, the light that shines. They say, oh, I see that. And they take hold of the hope that there is in Christ. That's why it says, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The light comes on. Boy, I can remember when it happened to me. I can remember when I saw the word of God and I saw what it was talking about. What it just opened up. Began to see things that I'd never understood before. This is the word of the Lord that is rubbable. Not by might nor by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, the light shone through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it tells us when it comes to God's Word, it says, For prophecy never came by the will of men. Never came by what? The will of men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who gave to them the words of Scripture so that when you and I read it, we see, we understand. It begins to open up, and it opens up more and more every day. I've been reading it for years. I can hard to even imagine how many years I've been reading it, you know. But I still read it, and the light comes on. I see something I hadn't known before. It, it will never come to the place where you read it and you know it all. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, I read it, and I say, oh, that's what that was talking about. That's because it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. It comes in, shows you and I, we understand it. That two witnesses that it's talking about, folks, is the Old and the New Testament. Those are the two witnesses he's talking about. This is the one that brings light to them. And so when he talks about his two witnesses, that produces light. This is the Word of God. The very same energy that God used in creating the world is in this book. And so when you and I read it, it's not like any other book. When I read it, there's a power there that you don't find any other place. A power, dear friend, that is capable of changing your heart and mind. It is the two witnesses that God is talking about here. Jesus said, 
concerning his word. He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I spoke will judge him in the last days. You see, this is the witness, the Old and New Testament. And he says, this is what will judge us by it. People always ask, you know, well, what about somebody who doesn't know? Well, you and I are judged by what we know. For me to know what God's Word says and not to follow it, that's wrong. That's wrong. But to the person over here who hasn't come that far yet, God understands that. He will be judged on that basis. But you and I must also be willing to be taught and to learn and to spend time in God's Word. Have to. I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days in sackcloth. So it's saying that these two witnesses that produce light, uh, this 1,260 days that they're going to prophesy, it's going to be rough. It's going to be in sackcloth. That means mourning. That means hard times, not easy. That's the time in which they will witness for 1,260 days. Now, this is talking about the conflict that's going on between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And he said, my witnesses are going to witness in sackcloth these 1260 days are mentioned over and over in Scripture. Daniel 7, 25, they're mentioned. Uh, Daniel 12, verse 7. Revelation 12, verse 6. Revelation 12, verse 14. Revelation 13, 5. And here in Revelation 11, all uses a combination of this that talks either about a time, times, or half a time, or it talks about 42 months, or it talks about 1260 days which all add up to be in the same period of time. I have laid on you a day for each year. Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. For each day you shall bear your, iniqu your guilt one year. So he's telling it simply that a day represents one year. So if I got time, that's one year, 360 days. Times represents two years 720 20 days, a half a time, a half a year, or 180. That added up gives you 1,260. As we just saw a minute ago, 30 times 42 added up gives you 1,260. The same amount of time. God used that, and as we talked about in our last presentation, it brings you down to the date of 1798, which began the time of the end. So what you have here, folks, is you have the time of the Jewish people. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people. We come down to that, and then you have the time of the Gentiles into 1798, and then begins the time of the end. And you and I are living in the time of the end. And, dear friend, you're not at the beginning of it. You're at the close of it. We're now at the very end of it, and we need to understand that, that there's not a lot of time left. This 1,260 years was going to be a terrible time. This is the time in history referred to as the Dark Ages. People were denied the Word of God. I mentioned the other pr in another presentation that by 500 A.D., the Bible had been translated into 500 other languages. And then it just seemed, folks, it just seemed that all of a sudden the curtain closed. Bang! And in a matter of 100 years, there was only one translation, and that was in Latin. And if you couldn't read Latin, 
Sorry. And the people that could didn't have access to the Word of God. So the Scripture was basically taken away from them, and this became a time of darkness. Those people that loved the Lord, and they loved the Word of God, and they desired to know the Word of God, and they had taken and handwritten out the Word of God so that they could keep it, those people found themselves having to flee from persecution. They were hunted, and they had to flee to different places, and they went up into the mountains where they could worship as they please. As I have walked through those, through those very mountains, looked where they lived. They lived there and tried to worship God, but even in those far-out far places, they were still sought, and many, many, many of them were killed, killed for their faith. In fact, during that period of time, for about a thousand years, it's hard to describe how bad it was. The people were told that they were too ignorant to read the Word of God. The Bible was taken from them, chained to library walls. If you, even if you had a Bible on you, you were subject to be put to death. You couldn't do that. In fact, the Waldensian people, in order to spread it, took it, little pages of it, and put it into their clothing sewed it into their clothing. If they found somebody that was interested, they would undo it and take it out and read them the Word of God. Uh, it was horrible during those period of time. John Wycliffe, known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, cited that he would translate the Bible into English for the people had to run most of his life because they were seeking him to kill him. In fact, when they finally arrested him and were going to, uh, he died on them before they got him to the stake, to burn him at the stake. But this was a, when it says a time of sackcloth, this was a hard, hard period of time. John and Jerome the, these men tried to serve the Lord uh, because they followed the writings of Wycliffe. Uh, he was burned at the stake. His partner, Jerome, uh, was taken and put in prison and, and just locked away until kept in chain in there until the flesh on his body literally rotted and uh, finally trying to get him to recant. And when he finally gave up some of his belief because of the terrible situation and was so sorry for he had even done that, and they threw him back in prison, burned him at the stake. John Huss and Jerome great, great men. But out of this period of time in which these men suffered so much, and then along came Luther, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg. And you find that things begin to change. Along came other men like John Calvin and like Swingley. And these men stood up and preached the Word of God and then finally, the princes of Europe stood up and said, we're not going to do this any longer. We're going to follow the Bible. We're going to follow the dictates of our conscience. And they refused to follow it. And the persecution began to drop off, folks, began to fall off. Then you hit 1798, 1260 years, 1798. And it says in 1798, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. And that time of persecution 
came to an end. Stopped. But then something happened. Because the scripture says, and when they finished their testimony, finished their testimony, 1798, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, this is the same bottomless pit that we talked about just earlier in the other presentations where it talks about the, the star coming out of this bottomless pit, okay? And he will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Who's he going to overcome and kill? I want to make sure you're with me. Who is he going to overcome and kill? The two witnesses, that's right. Make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So, what happened? Well, at this time, a man by the name of Thomas Paine has written, call, written a book called The Age of Reason. That has circulated across Europe. Circulated across Europe, and people from reading that book begin to throw out religion. The country of France, who had been one of the foremost in accepting the Reformation, and which through the preaching of John Calvin, some 500,000 Frenchmen had accepted the Reformation and the belief and all, France turned against it, and she began to persecute it terribly. But because of the persecution that she put on the people, when this type book came out and the people read it, they turned on religion. They turned on religion so much that they established what they called the age of reason. And they threw religion out of the country, said they would have nothing to do with it. January the 21st, 1793. The world for the first time heard an assembly of men, born and educated in civilization, assuming the right to govern one of the finest European nations, uplift their voice to deny the most solemn truth which man's soul receives, renounce unanimously the belief and the worship of a deity. They turned against it. But did France make war on the Bible? She did. And in 1793, a decree passed on the French assembly forbidding the Bible. And under, the decree, under that decree, Bibles were gathered and burned and every possible mark of contempt heaped upon them. And all the institutions of the Bible abolished, baptism, communion were abolished, and the being of God denied. You see, the two witnesses were thrown out, thrown in the street. They were gathered up and burned in France. And death pronounced to be an eternal sleep, the goddess of reason was set up in the person of a vile woman and publicly worshipped. They turned against the scripture, they burned it in piles, and they took a woman, put her on a cart, and pulled her through the streets of Paris and worshipped her as the goddess of reason. And so you find that this beast that rose out of the bottomless pit turned on the Word of God and killed the two witnesses. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Very important that you understand when it says spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. In other words, it's not talking about the literal city of Sodom and Egypt. It's making an application spiritually is what it's doing and also to the place where Christ was crucified. That is being used in a symbolic form. What does it mean? Pharaoh, Egypt. You remember the children of Israel were in Egypt and Moses went in and told Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should let his that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. You find that Egypt represented basically atheism. They had, were against God, went against him. He said, I don't know the Lord. Who is he? And he wouldn't let Israel go. 
Sodom, Sodom, you remember, was destroyed because of its terrible morals, because it had lost its morality, and it was destroyed for that reason. You see, when they passed the decree to get rid of the Scripture, and they threw the Scripture out, they lost anything by which they could have a standard, and the morals in France dropped clear to the bottom, folks, clear to the bottom. It's, you can't even describe the horribleness of that period of time when the whole country lost its morals. That's the reason it refers to it as Sodom and Gomorrah. And when they gave up the Bible and threw it out, if you believed in God, they would take you downtown and guillotine you. I mean, you, you could not believe in God and live, and they did that to all the religions. Didn't make whether you were Protestant or Catholic. You were guillotined for believing in the Bible and God. They died by the untold thousands, so much so that blood ran down the gutters of the streets of Paris from the number of people that they guillotined. And it says, and the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's why he said, and where our Lord was crucified, he said, You did it to these people, you did it to me. The gospel of peace, which France had rejected, was to be only too surely rooted out, and terrible would be the results on the 21st of January, 1793. Now listen carefully to this. 250 years from the very day that fully committed France to the persecution of the Reformers. Now we're going back 258 years. 258 years before that is when France turned against the Reformation. This is the exact date. 258 years later this is what is happening. Another procession with a far different purpose is passing through the streets of Paris. Again, the king was the chief figure. Again, there was tumult and shooting. Again, there was heard the cry for more victims. Again, there was the black scaffolds. Again, the scene of that day were closed by a horrible execution. Louis XVI struggling hand-to-hand -hand with his jailers and executioners, was dragged forward to the block and, they held, and held down by main force till the axe had fallen and his dissevered head rolled on the scaffolds. 258 years later, the king of France was beheaded. This was the time of the reign of terror that took place. Then those from the people, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the grave. You know, the Bible was ruled out of France, and it was to lay there for three and a half days. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because the two prophets tormented those who dwelt on the earth. I don't have time to go into this, but it always is surprising to me because France took this stand and established the age of reason, and all other nations wrote them and said, how wonderful you are and how brilliant you are, and their whole morals were falling to the floor, and they were losing their whole nation at the same time. Uh, so people ready to jump on the bandwagon and not to stand for what is right and what is truth. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of God or the breath of life from God entered them. They stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Those two witnesses, after three and a half days, stood on their feet. In other words, says that these two witnesses of the Old and New Testament that France had thrown out after three and a half days was going to come back. Watch this. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. 
In other words, if there's something that's sure, it's the prophetic word. So watch what happens here. January the 21st, 1793, France threw it out throughout the Bible. On June the 10th, 1796, they voted it back in because the whole country had gone down the tubes. They had lost everything so much, and so it was so bad that January the 10th, 1796, they voted it back in. That's exactly three and a half years, just exactly as the Scripture said it would be. It came back to life. See, the Word of God stood. Now, uh, let me bring this to a close as quick as I can here. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Here was 1796. This is what happens. 1804, you have the British Bible Society. The Bible now is being published and sent out to all the different countries. 1816, the American Bible Society is established. The Bible is being taken everywhere. At this same time, Judson goes to Burma, Carey to India, Morrison to China, Moffat and Livingston to Africa. These are missionaries, and the Word of God is being spread all over the earth. But at the same time, you have coming out of this age of reason, the writings of Thomas Paine, you have teachings such as evolution, uh, also new morality. You have all these things that are springing up at the same time, and these are in opposition to one another and will remain that way until Jesus comes. And much of the things that you and I face today is because of those teachings. Unfortunately, our educational system across this country is full of evolution. It teaches it. Students come out not believing in God. And yet, this is a conflict that is there that's going on because of that time. That's when you have Darwin. That's when you have uh, these different men that taught contrary to what the Word of God said. So you and I need to be clear where we are concerning the Word of God. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Uh, this is what's taking place. This is the time that we're living in, and that's why it talks about the two witnesses, what happened, and they, that is to help you and I understand where we are in the stream of time. Because after this, it's right after this, that the seventh trumpet is sounded in which he sets up, God sets up his kingdom. That's what happens next. This brings the whole part of the trumpets to a close. And then the Bible begins to pick up a new scenario and take you and I through it step by step, dealing, folks, dealing in a very, very specific way right down here at the end of time and what is happening and what is taking place. So we hope that you'll continue to study, look at the book of Revelation as we study together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the one who watches over the things of this world and that your word is sure that it doesn't fail. And we pray that we might hold on, that we might make it the light of our life and that we will walk in the light of its word and that we'll stand firm upon the Word of God, willing to trust you and to let you guide and lead in our lives. Bless each one. May the Word of God become dear to them and draw them close to Jesus Christ, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our next presentation is on Revelation 12, War in Heaven. And we're going to take a look at something that begins to develop there, folks. 
And uh, it begins to put some things together, such as the dragon and the beast and the false prophet begins to pull those things together that has to do right down at the end of time. So thank you for being with us. God bless you. Stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, thousands risk their lives to protect and serve their fellow men. They have a deep commitment to excellency and teamwork. And when others run from danger, they run to it. Even if it means personal sacrifice. Even if it means making the supreme sacrifice for another. They're always on call, ready to serve, no matter what. Friends, you and I can learn a lot from firefighters. In the United States, the majority of them are volunteers. That's right, volunteers. But even for those who are paid, it's more than a job, it's a calling. Jesus said in John 15, verses 12 and 13, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Those who follow the words of Jesus are his friends. But Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing thought. Christ laid down his life for us, even though we were not his friends. A firefighter is willing to do the same. He's constantly preparing for his next mission because his own life and the life of others depends on his training and qualifications. My friends, that's what we're doing right now with this series. We are preparing you for what is to come. Our goal is to make you skilled in the Word so that by the power of God you can bring others to safety, the safety that can be found only in the arms of a loving Savior. Won't you help us to train and prepare others to fulfill this mission? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the second series, Revelations from God's Throne Room, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series, including Worthy is the Lamb, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, The 144,000, The Seven Trumpets, The Time of the End, The Two Witnesses, and War in Heaven may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.